Hello there, digital world. Welcome back to yet another episode of Splice Simulator. I hope you all are well out there in the digital world. Uh, new episode today, a little later than normal. Now, I need to say in advance before doing this episode that I might need to apologize in advance due to a number of reasons. Whether this episode seems a bit uh, scatterbrained or less enthusiastic, because uh, this is a top 10 countdown. And normally they go on for a long time and they're pretty thorough and uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm behind it. Um, you may not get that. You may. I don't know. We'll find out at the end after I've recorded it all. Uh, if you've been keeping up with my socials and all that, you will know that one of my lovely kitties, uh, Winston, who has made frequent guest appearances on this show, whether he's been invited on or not, has just had a... A bit of a rough couple of days, uh, just a little bit of a funny tummy, uh, a little bit of voms, we've all been there, uh, but obviously it's a cat, uh, and it's just been sort of trying to figure out what's going on with him, taking him to the vets, changing his food and diet, all of that stuff. Uh, at the same time, I also have been unwell, so it's been, a, it's been an exhaustive last couple of days, um, and I made the decision to postpone doing this until I felt that I was well enough and that uh, Winston was okay enough that I could focus on this. Uh, I don't think Winston is out of the woods just yet. Um, he's currently on some medication and we'll be keeping an eye on him, but so far uh, he has not been sick again, which is great. And for the most part during this whole thing, he's still been the same cheerful, chirpy, happy-go-lucky orange fluff ball that he normally is. So fingers crossed that's all gonna be okay. And I myself feel relatively okay. Uh, but yeah, so just if you're listening to this and you're like, it sounds like he doesn't really care or wow, he talked about that for a few seconds or he doesn't seem like he knows what he's talking about. Um, one, that's generally the show. <laughs> it's not unusual, uh, but also that sort of stuff's going on. So just uh, keep that in mind. But we're keeping on, keeping on. And as I said last week, I wanted to do this to get on the hype train of what's going on at the moment. And this was a good time to slide it in before the eventual Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania Mania will kick off on this channel uh, next week. Uh, we are doing the top 10 spliced in later Pokemon movies. Uh, a bit of backstory for Pokemon, I love it. I think we all do. Pokemon is a very, 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 very strong part of my childhood. Uh, when I was a kid, I lived, I ate, drank, breathed Pokemon. I slept and dreamt of Pokemon. I played the games, I watched the show, I collected the cards, I did everything possible, I played with coloring books. Um, and then as I've got older, uh, at least my generation of Pokemon, I've looked back on fondly and I've held onto it and I cherish it. Which I think is the same for everybody. Pokemon has been around now for 27 years, possibly longer. And every couple of years, uh, the powers that be behind Pokemon create another 100 or 150 and throw them on the pile. When I started with Pokemon, there were 150, with the 151st being the mysterious Mew. Apparently there's now 1,008. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I doubt anyone can name all 1,008, and if you can, I take my hat off to you. But I think for the most part, whichever was the main Pokemon generation while you were growing up with it, that's what you're gonna remember fondly. Me, it's Kanto. Um, my younger brother, Johto. Uh, sons and grandsons and all that stuff now they're into galar or hisui or whatever the hell it's called uh the one constant for me though for pokemon has been the anime following the adventures of ash ketchum and his wonderful best friend for life pikachu as they travel each region with whoever's traveling with them at the time ideally misty and brock uh fighting gyms collecting badges catching pokemon or in ash's case just making friends with them jesus christ and of course, beating Team Rocket, the lovable Jesse James and Meowth, uh, with Ash's ultimate goal to be the greatest trainer of all time. Here we are 27 years since it first started, and the show has finally had Ash win a championship, defeat uh, the greatest trainer of all time, and become a world champion. He's sort of on a victory lap now, going back through his old haunts, meeting old Pokemon, old travelers, but the... Pokemon anime powers at B are saying that this is it for Ash. Once this is over, when Pokemon comes back, it will be new characters, uh, new situations. The, the status quo of Ash and Pikachu that has been constant for all our lives will be gone. 
naturally everyone's a little bit emotional about the whole thing i'm sure i will be one day when i watch whatever it is uh that when it, whatever the final episode actually is i don't know when that is because it seems to just be special episode after special episode but whatever hopefully the last episode is ash finally going back for his pidgeot because what the hell man where to forget your friends uh, but of course everyone's celebrating in their own way so i thought i want to do something to do with pokemon the top 10 is always good i can't do my top 10 favorite pokemon because how do you narrow down from a thousand and eight i can't talk about my favorite regions because it would just be the first 150 and then i don't really care uh but i thought the movies the movies might be a good ranking period because the movies are a very good time capsule for whatever pokemon is at that point in time whatever legendaries are being focused on uh the creative powers that are behind pokemon as well how that influences the show the types of characters are involved which means the pokemon movies can vary from being really really awesome to just absolutely forgettable so i thought why not here on spice and ladder we'll rank them now as usual a little bit of unpacking before we get into it um my list is not going to be the same as everyone else's list i can't say because i've not seen them all because i have seen every pokemon movie and I always make sure I see the new one as soon as I can. The show, I tend to wait and then catch up on after a couple of years, but the movies I tend to stick with. Uh, your favorite movies, I think, are absolutely going to be biased. Everyone's going to remember the movies that stuck with them, same with the generations as kids, which means having just said I come from the original squad, the original 150, uh, you can probably guess which movies are going to dominate this ranking. Um, don't get mad about it. I understand. I'm looking at these on an objective light. I do think that my list is is half biased, but also half general just acknowledgement of superior writing and, and character development, all of that over just, here's the obligatory Pokemon movie of the year. Here's the obligatory legendary Pokemon that Ash meets. All right, moving on to the next one. But we're all going to disagree. Uh, my advice to you is to not get upset about it. And just as usual make your own list uh, have fun discussions about why each Pokemon movie is great not why everyone sucks because they think this movie is great or that movie is great I know for, I'm pretty sure there's one movie on my list which will be a hot topic for everyone who's gonna be like how can that be in your top 10 list over all these others and I look at that movie and I go that's a hundred percent just catered for my liking I can acknowledge that that's probably not one of the best Pokemon movies but for me my personal ranking I enjoy it the most, I get the most out of it, so it's going to go on my list. Alright, so without further ado, let's get right into it. Splice and Later's top 10 movies from the Pokemon anime. Now coming in at number 10 is Pokemon Ranger and the Temple of the Sea. The 10th spot was really hard for this list. As I just said, your Pokemon movies will absolutely be influenced by your nostalgia and your bias and what appeals to you. And for me, there's huge gaps between the quality of the Pokemon on this list. I would say there's a huge gap between number one and two on the rest of the list, and then three, four, and five, and six, then another huge gap, then uh, nine, eight and nine or whatever, and then uh, the last one is real. So basically what I'm saying is what's at number 10 is nowhere near as good as what's number nine. It's, the list is not as tightly close as it would be for other lists that I've done. Uh, that being said, it's it's a far cry between a movie that is bad and a movie that is okay. And I think that's the case for quite a lot of these Pokemon movies. They're not bad by any sense. They're just okay. They're not particularly memorable. They're not incompetent, but they're not something that's going to stick with you. And I have, as I said, probably three, four, five movies that have stuck with me. Uh, another four, which are relatively okay. And then when I was going for number 10, I'm like, okay, what out of all these other movies stands out to me? Uh, as a result, for a first for these rankings, I did have to go back and rewatch a couple of them. And I discussed it with some friends and I eventually landed on Pokemon Ranger and the Temple of the Sea. Basically on rewatchability, uh, even though I knew what was coming, I had just as much fun watching it. I think it's uh, it does well for its concept because at the end of the day, it is an advertisement for the Pokemon Ranger spin-off games. 
uh, but manages to have a really exciting balance of Pokemon Ranger stuff, Ash and Pikachu stuff, the obligatory legendary Pokemon that appear, um, and the the actual story that gets everybody wrapped up and involved in this, which is basically Ash and a Pokemon Ranger teaming up to protect a... It's either a Fioni or it's a Manaphy. I don't know the difference, but I'm pretty sure it's a Fioni. It's a little blue legendary Pokemon that May becomes absolute best friends with, and she decides she's going to protect it at all costs. Uh, terrible people are after it because it's got something to do with Atlantis, the lost city of Atlantis, raising that to the to the to the surface or whatever. Nefarious purposes in order to do that probably means Fioni will die. Uh, so Ash and Co. and the Pokemon Ranger have to stop it. Look, as I say, it's it. That's if that's a unflattering like, yeah, okay. That's sort of how I feel about the movie, but it's how I feel about a lot of it. The thing that pushed Pokemon Ranger on top over the everybody else and got it to the temp spot was that at the end of the movie, Ash becomes king of the sea, <laughs> king of all seas, king of the seven seas, and he's flying around in a in a a water jet thing with Pikachu, uh, basically ruling over his new domain. That's pretty cool. That's pretty interesting. Of all the things that have happened to Ash. That's pretty unique. So that's sort of what put it in the temp spot. Uh, overall, the movie itself is perfectly fine. I was intrigued and interested by the Pokemon Ranger stuff because I've never played those games. It's an interesting concept of someone who can temporarily catch a Pokemon to use it to help in a certain situation, but then has to let it go. But to be fair, that's basically how Ash has always approached his Pokemon training in general. He has a Pokemon for a bit and then he lets it go because why not? He may be a Pokemon master, but he's very wishy-washy when it comes to training or keep... Anyway, whatever. We're getting off topic on that. The concept of the, this, the Atlantis as well in the Pokemon world and how Pokemon are a part of that is pretty interesting. I like when they take real-life concepts like Atlantis or something like the Aztecs or uh, King Arthur, anything like that. Something that has a real-life human lore or, or mystery or myth, anything like that. And they put it in Pokemon world and say, what if this, but Pokemon? So this is basically, what if Atlantis, but Pokemon? And that's pretty cool too. Uh, the villains as well are interesting. I couldn't tell you their names, but it's always nice when the villains are not just Team Rocket, but not Jesse and James. It's nice when someone has a connection other than just Team Rocket so bad. Uh, very few villains in these movies are like that. The ones that are not associated with Team Rocket in any way, I think, stand out the most. Except for maybe something that's to do with Giovanni, the head of Team Rocket, because then you're getting into the bare bones of Team Rocket. But it's just, we can't have Jesse and James be the bad guys because they're the lovable goofballs. But we can't think of another bad guy to use. So what if Jesse and James, but actually evil and competent at their jobs, that ends up being a lot of these movies. It's not the case of Pokemon Ranger in the Temple of the Sea. I think of all the um, all the Hoenn movies. Uh, no, is it Hoenn? No, it's uh, Sinnoh. No, it might be Hoenn. I don't know. I don't care. I'm getting confused because the thing I want to say is that it does a good job, at least for the English dub, of running with a new crowd. For a long, long time in the English dub, Ash and Friends been voiced by the same voice actors. Due to a pay dispute at the end of season eight, they all went. Uh, and then you, for season nine, uh, you had to get to used to a whole new voice crew. Um, I'm pretty sure there was a drop in uh, quality as well, in money being funded into the English dub. That's probably why everybody left. They were not getting the money they deserved. Uh, the openings became less cool. Uh, it just seemed, it seemed inferior to what came before it. I will say the movie did a good job though, of me getting used to these new voices and this new style. Uh, when it looked like effort was actually being put into it, it seemed okay. Nowadays, the new voice of Ash has been Ash longer than the old voice of Ash, and I'm totally fine with it. It's won me over. But in those early days, I was really struggling with it, and Temple of the Sea helped to go, okay, all right, I think it'll be okay. Perfectly acceptable, good enough movie. Uh, Ash, King of the Sea, all right, it gets to be number 10. Coming in at number nine is Pokemon Heroes, Latios and Latias. Uh, this is the last of the original series movies. So technically it's part of the Johto era, but it's that last from the original run where it was Ash, Misty and Brock wearing the same clothes, 
going the same places, doing the same things. In this, if they're basically in a Pokemon version of Venice, uh, playing games, having fun, uh, but uh, living in this Venice city are the legendary Pokemon Latios and Latias. Uh, Latios is the the wise old mentor type Pokemon. Latias is the young, uh, headstrong uh, kid version who wants to see the world and experience it. So it turns into a girl and kind of falls in love with Ash. Uh, meanwhile, annoyingly, as I said, uh, not Jesse and James, but Team Rocket want Latios and Latias uh, do some stuff. Of course, interfering with that means that if they're not careful, this not Venice, but Venice City is going to get washed away by a large tidal wave. Uh, watching this movie after coming off Pokemon Forever, I was like, okay, I can see why these movies aren't being released in the cinemas anymore. Uh, and I can sort of feel like uh, even the people behind the movies themselves are getting a little like, okay, we have to make a movie. What are we going to make it about? We're running out of legendary Pokemon. We're running out of reasons for Ash to be involved in this sort of stuff. I like the whole concept of, again, a real life sort of place in Pokemon world. So the Venice city is very interesting. I like the idea of Latios and Latias, like they're different personality types. I like Latias uh, changing into a human and that mystery that Ash is not quite aware of what's going on, but we are. That's sort of interesting to have the information that he doesn't have. Uh, the villains, I guess for the most part, they're interesting because it's a different combination of Team Rocket bad guys. It's two women instead of a man and a woman. Um, and they have some interesting stuff with uh, one of them getting corrupted absolutely by some by evil and uh, just completely losing their mind, which is pretty good. Uh, it only edges out slightly over Temple of the Sea and the others really because it's nostalgia playing into this one. I watched this, the Master Quest song is playing, uh, seeing Totodile and Noctowl and all of those Pokemon from those later years when I was watching Pokemon religiously, pushes it up. The Latias Latias legendaries are interesting. Um, it has a pretty intense climax where it looks like everybody is literally going to die. Uh, perfectly fine, acceptable movie coming in at number nine. At number eight is the only live action unique movie on this list, which is Detective Pikachu. In 2019, the Pokemon family rolled the dice coming out with a live action movie with real humans and the most terrifying CG Pokemon you could ever see. We follow Justice Smith playing a, playing a young kid who has lost track of his father. His father appears to have died, uh, but his father's companion Pokemon Pikachu is still around. Pikachu can talk and calls himself a detective. And the two of them have to solve the mystery of what happened to Justice Smith's dad what's going on in the larger scheme of things involving Pokemon and corporations, what is, what is Bill Nye up to, uh, and how does it all revolve around mysterious sightings of Mewtwo, who may or may not be killing people, we don't know. Uh, for, look, for what it's worth, Detective Pikachu was successful and it was an enjoyable watch. Um, Ryan Reynolds is the voice of Detective Pikachu, and while it is frustrating that a lot of the times he just dis uh, basically approaches all his roles like, what if I were Deadpool? But doing this instead. Uh, but he does a good job of the Pikachu personality. The detective style I think is quite likable. Ryan Reynolds is very likable so it works. Uh, the Pokemon in the live action world are sometimes really really cool and really really horrifying. Some like Charizard or Bulbasaur look wonderful. And then you've got uh, oof, some really horrifying things like Trubbish or Grimer and uh, you just sort of go I don't want to see that at all that's crazy uh but the movie embraced all aspects of pokemon so it probably would have been easy to just stick with the original ones that everybody knows about but they bring in all sorts of pokemon there's torteras in here uh flabebes which are weird things that float on flowers whatever uh it's very appealable to western audiences if it's very much made for us rather than uh japanese audiences which i guess is an interesting approach to something like that. Uh, pretty good, interesting mystery. I'm coming off a kick of uh, mystery films and Poirot and Knives Out and all of that, I do enjoy a good mystery. Um, and it is sort of split. 
one twist you can see coming a mile off and another sort of goes, what? Okay, that's pretty interesting. Uh, involving one of the most frightening Pokemon in this whole thing, bloody ditto, what the hell. Um, I think uh, Detective Pikachu obligatorily gets on this list because of it being a live action and what it accomplishes, and I genuinely have a good time with it. Here it is at number eight. At number seven is Pokemon I Choose You, which is one of the first anniversary style movies for Pokemon. Uh, basically set in its own timeline. It basically retells the story of Ash's beginning as a Pokemon trainer, meeting Pikachu, how they originally can't stand each other in the beginning, but then become lifelong friends. The difference between the anime TV show and this movie uh, differentiates from that. So Ash travels with different people who have different Pokemon because uh, I Choose You came out around sun and moon time, I think. Yes, sun and moon time. Uh, half the movie is also trying to focus on advertising Pokemon from that era, which means the new people that we meet have those types of Pokemon. But a lot of the beats we hit are very memorable beats from the TV show. Ash having to let go of Butterfree. Ash saving an uh, abandoned Charmander from dying because its tail's about to go out. Um, the whole issue of Pikachu going in a Pokeball. Um, Team Rocket encountering them, all of that stuff. It's very well done. For a movie that could have just been a phone it in, hey, just remember Pokemon. Remember, we'll just do the bits you remember. It walks a very fine line and walks it well between doing that, allowing us to remember the nostalgia and feel the feels of seeing Ash and Pikachu go on their adventures again, but also telling a new story. There's an overarching plot, uh, overarching problem that's affecting Ash and Pikachu that eventually comes to a head at the end. The new characters, the new Pokemon. Sure, I don't remember their names, uh, but that's only because I've seen this movie a couple of times. Not in any sense were they unmemorable characters. Uh, it's just, you know, if I had a choice, I'd prefer Misty and Brock. But it's cool that they did that. It's a, it's a nice balance between the two. And I think coming off, I think what came before this, Genesect and the Legend Awakened, it's refreshing to go into this movie and be like, there's a lot of love and effort put into it. This isn't just obligatory... Uh, here's the movie that comes out this year for Pokemon. All right, cool, done. Let's move on to the next one. This is one going, okay, a, a milestone's coming up. Let's really celebrate Ash. We're kind of limited with what we can do when we stick with the, the main anime timeline as well, especially when our movies have to sort of not be important enough that it changes the show. The show has to carry on as if the movies never happened. Very rarely are movies ever referenced on the show. So let's do something new. Let's uh, embrace change. Let's really put our efforts into telling a good Ash and Pikachu story, but also really cherish and remember where we came from. And it worked really well, and people really liked it, and that launched basically a whole bunch of movies from this timeline. So it's Ash and Pikachu in their own little bubble, going on their own adventures. Some movies are references to older movies. Some are brand new types of movies. Um, and they're all the quality on them is... I think a lot better animation style, story wise, characters, threat, uh, than many of the original timeline animes, animes, movies that came out before it. Um, a lot of people love I Choose You and would put it much higher on the list. I again am stuck by what I like from a Pokemon movie and a lot of that is nostalgia, but still I Choose You, solid movie, number seven. Keeping to this timeline, this new Ash and Pikachu timeline, at number six is the most recent Pokemon movie, Pokemon Secrets of the Jungle, which again, takes something that I enjoy doing, which is a, a myth or story from real life world, puts it in Pokemon. In this case, what if Tarzan was Pokemon? Or in Pokemon, I should say. In this movie, there's a young boy, I believe he's called Coco. Uh, he is living in in the in the forest don't ask me what pokemon he's living with because i can never remember the names of the new stuff it's a big big yellow tiger thing uh he's grown up with them he obviously thinks he's one of them uh, he comes across ash and pikachu and he goes oh wait a minute very tarzan there are people that look like me perhaps i am a human the difference being imagine in tarzan if carla had come back to kerchak with tarzan and said he's my son and kerchak went well you can piss off and Carla had to go and live alone with Tarzan and stay away from the rest of the gorillas, but also every other creature in the world, in the forest, because they're going to kill him. 
That's basically what's happening with Coco and his Pokemon dad. His de- Pokemon dad brings him back to the tribe. The tribe goes, fuck that off. That's a human. Get out of here. So they have to go and live in the forest separately. Meanwhile, there's uh, an interesting plot involving Ash where originally he's helping some people who are supposedly going into the forest because they want to find a special artifact and, and put it in a museum. But the guy running it has nefarious purposes in play. He's desperate to get this thing and he'll destroy anyone and anything in his path to get it. Uh, Jesse and James get roped into the plot. It's a really good take on the Tarzan story and I really, really like it. Um, As of me recording this, it's the last Pokemon movie to come out. It jumped in uh, late because COVID kicked off and really shut at a lot of doors. Uh, I believe after this though, they must have known the focus would be to finish Ash's anime story. So I think... I don't know if we're going to get another movie, but if this is the very last Ash and Pikachu movie, Secrets of the Jungle is pretty awesome. It's a really interesting take on Tarzan. I highly recommend it. If you haven't watched a Pokemon movie in a while uh, and you need to go back and you're not sure where to start, probably this one. This will leave a good taste in your mouth. It'll remind you why you like the protagonists of Ash and Pikachu. It'll remind you why Pokemon movies can be quite clever and unique when they try more than just He's the obligatory legendary Pokemon. This is, case in point, it is a Pokemon movie about a human. The legendary Pokemon or the new Pokemon or even Ash and Pikachu take a backseat to the development of this Coco story and Coco's character development. And I really like that. So that's why it's sitting in at number six. At number five is the movie. I warned you all at the start. Uh, If you're familiar with Pokemon movies, you'll be like, why the hell is this on your list? And why is it so high? It's Kiram versus the Sword of Justice, uh, a movie that notoriously is on the bottom of a lot of people's Pokemon lists, but for me, I can't get enough of it. Uh, so in this movie, it's kind of a take on the three Musketeers storyline. You've got Keldeo, who's like the D'Artagnan of this movie. He's the young, inexperienced of the four. I think they're lions. They're like horse combined with lion Pokemon creatures. Anyway, he's got three much older ones, uh, Cobra Lion, Terrakeon, Vivision, whatever. They're basically uh, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. Um, Keldeo calls himself the Sword of Justice. He wants to prove himself and take down what he believes is um, the, their, their all-time enemy, which he's correct. Uh, it's this bitch of a Pokemon called Kiram, who's all about causing trouble and, and stepping on people. Uh, Keldeo gets headstrong, tries to take him out, ends up compromising the other three. Um, so in order to fight back and save them, and from Kiram, Keldo, Keldeo has to team up with Ash and friends. Um, look, I can understand why you'd be annoyed. When I complain about the others being blah, this could be considered blah as well. It's probably because it's got the Three Musketeers stuff in it that I like it so much. But I also like... It's one of the few Pokemon movies where Ash and friends aren't actually relevant to the story. They're in it, because they gotta be, but the the movie is not centered around Ash being the chosen one, or Ash is the only one that can step in and save the day. The Keldeo versus Kurum thing is completely separate to everything that's going on. It has no impact on the world at large. Kurum's not looking to destroy the world. If Keldeo doesn't save the other three, uh, the earth isn't going to split in two. If Ash doesn't step up and save Keldeo, uh, Giovanni's going to pocket him for nefarious games. It's just this nice little Three Musketeers character development homage to the character of Keldeo and his his rivalry with Kurum and his friendship with the other Musketeer Pokemon people. Ash and friends show up. They're there to provide Keldeo support, encouragement. They're there to stand with him. But at the end of the day, if Ash didn't show up, uh, I don't think it would have changed too much. Um, And if Keldeo hadn't won the day, that would suck, but life would have continued on as normal. So it's really how much you care about the stakes being so little, about Ash and Pikachu having such a minimal effect on the story, and whether you like the Three Musketeers. I like all of those things. I think they're great. They're unique to a Pokemon movie. They're interesting. And I remember sitting down to watch it, expecting to be like, okay, at this point, I powered through a lot of Pokemon movies and I'm like, okay, now they're just getting whatever. I think right before this is the the stupid two versions movie where you can watch the movie uh, in two different forms with a different 
uh, legendary Pokemon, but it's the same movie. But you have to watch it twice. You have to watch Pokemon Black, and then you have to watch Pokemon White. You don't have to, but it's just sort of like you've just made the same movie in two different ways. That's If that's not a cash grab, I don't know what is. Uh, so I expected this to be more of the same, but I genuinely loved it. I had a smile on my face the whole time. I want to put it higher, uh, but that would be getting silly. But I'm very happy with it at number five. Uh, coming in at number four, Lucario and the Mystery of Mew. I know for a lot of people, this is everybody's favorite, and it's such a solid one. A Pokemon movie that has genuine lore, uh, stakes, um, emotion as well. It's pretty great. It's coming from a time, uh, so it's, it's built off long, long ago where Pokemon were literally warring to death. They just could not stop fighting. So this, this hero and his Pokemon partner Lucario have to find a way to unite all the Pokemon to stop them fighting. Uh, the hero dies, I think, or is, or is vanished. It's hard to say with Pokemon. You never know if people have actually died or not. But uh, Lucario is left alone for years and years and years. He loses faith in Pokemon. He loses faith in humans. Um, comes across Ash. Uh, Ash, of course, being happy-go-lucky. We're all friends and I love you. Completely contrasting with each other. But then have to team up for some world-ending apocalypse thing. Which is literally going to destroy the world if they don't team up to stop it. Uh, again, it's it's really good when they focus on a pokemon and give them actual personality and character and ash is 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 not the primary focus ash is more of a focus in this absolutely than kiram uh but this is lucario's movie and there's so much depth and character and sorrow and tragedy to lucario's backstory his time on earth how he approaches other characters uh him having him slowly come around to humans in general but also to value ash as a potential friend and partner i think is pretty great uh some real world ending stakes here as well if completely opposite to to what i was saying about keldeo um if ash and lucario don't come to come together and stop what's happening in this movie uh literally all life as we know it will come to an end um again it was a more adult movie as well when it's talking about the older stuff going on with Pokemon and like warring for years and years and people dying as a result of Pokemon being unable to stop fighting, that's some pretty good stuff. I believe this is also the one as well where like Ash and Misty and Brock, uh, no, oh God, I have to remember who was in the movie, May and Max and Brock and all of that. Uh, when the end is coming and it looks like they're going to die, the humans are sacrificing themselves and releasing their Pokemon at the last minute so they're not taken over by this world-ending apocalypse thing. Even Jesse and James are doing it. Some pretty intense stuff. Lucario and the Mystery of Mew, I think, before I Choose You came out years and years later, was the last well-written Pokemon movie that had genuine effort put into the story, the characters, the lore, all of that stuff. Coming off of very forgettable things like Jirachi Wismaker and Destiny Deoxys, this was a really, really surprisingly powerful movie that was also a brush of fresh air for sure, coming in at number four. And then of course my top three are the original three movies, and again, it's all bias, but whatever, it's my list, I can do what I want. And number three is Pokemon 3, Spell of the Unknown, so this was the third movie in the franchise but the first to focus on the new generation of pokemon in this instance it's quite a compelling story it's this girl who lives in a mansion uh her father studies the mysterious pokemon called the unknown the girl has uh, suffered a lot of tragedy in her youth she's lost her mother and then when her father goes exploring for this unknown pokemon he also disappears uh she's overcome with grief the unknown find her and use her grief to create a fantasy world for her, even creating the legendary Pokemon Entei because she believes that Entei is actually her father. Uh, she lives up in her little crystal palace. She wants a mother though, so Entei goes, all right, you can have Ash's mother and takes her away. So now Ash and Misty and Brock have to break into the crystal fortress to save Ash's mother, fighting literally conjured from thin air Pokemon that are completely unstoppable. Luckily though, Ash's Charizard who is been away for some time, we'll come back and help save the day. Of the three original, it is of course the weakest of the three, hence why it's number three on the list. Uh, it's an interesting movie, it's quite dark as well in terms of 
whether or not the little girl's parents are dead or not or stuck in a different dimension um of course being kind of directed for kids you know it's all going to work out for her in the end but for a long time you're sort of like jesus christ uh everybody gets a role in this movie too what's good about some of these movies and what's bad about others is a lot of the times its focus is so much on ash and pikachu that it does neglect the secondary characters who do want to shine a little bit more in this instance misty and brock and team rocket uh this is the first movie where brock and misty really get to actually step up and do something even if it's just I will distract the fake Pokemon for you, Ash, while you ascend another floor in the Crystal Palace. Uh, we focus on them. We see Brock go down fighting against uh, the little girl's super strong arsenal of imaginary Pokemon. We see Misty fighting underwater to do that sort of stuff as well. You get to see their Pokemon. You get to see them battling. That's a nice change than just them standing on the sidelines going, Ash, Ash, we're here. We'll help by watching. Uh, of course, having Charizard's comeback was always great too. Um, it's a unique movie about learning to accept tragedy, to not let grief overwhelm you, but also understand that grief is a natural part of life, um, which I think is a heavy lesson for kids, especially I think I was, what, ugh, 10, 11 when this movie came out? So that might have gone over my head. Uh, but Rewatching it, it gets better and better every time I do, and as an adult now, I can catch the adult jokes. I love the bit where Team Rocket runs into the room and sees all the unknown flying in the air. Unknown look like letters, and James goes, I haven't seen this many weird letters since I put out that ad. <laughs> Which is just, a kid's gonna go, ha, huh, that's funny, he sounds, James sounds funny. But if you're an adult, you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, you put an ad in a newspaper, you can get some weirdos. Cool. And even something as stupid as Meowth going, they look like alphabet soup without the soup. Like Back in the day, the amount of effort the voice cast put in to their roles in Pokemon was top notch. I do really love Spell of the Unknown and it's a really solid pick for number three, but it's no contest between number one and two, which we're about to go into now. Now you're probably wondering, oh, okay, so I can probably guess which one's going to be number two and which one's going to be number one. But I'm gonna warn you now that what you think you know you don't know because i am a contrarian i like things more than other people i like things less than other people and i'm the guy that put kieran versus the sword of justice as number five of all the pokemon movies uh so for me number two is pokemon the first movie mewtwo strikes back i know that's probably heinous to not put it at number one there's just one difference between this and the one above it that edges the one above it up and i'll talk about that when i get to number one uh but mewtwo strikes back it's the very first movie focusing on the very first legendary pokemon all-powerful thing mewtwo a clone of the mythical pokemon mew he's grown in a lab uh when he wakes up he's conscious he's got human thoughts uh he has a crisis of of self-worth and what is his purpose uh Unfortunately, he was created by Team Rocket, so he has to deal with their shit for a while before he realizes that his purpose really is to wipe out all humans so Pokemon can thrive, because humans suck, Pokemon rule. Uh, but he has a nefarious purpose that involves bringing what he believes to be the best Pokemon trainers to his mysterious island to get their Pokemon, or to clone them, I guess. Um, but his ultimate goal is that he's going to wipe out the world with some storm that he's managing to conquer up with his psychic powers. Ash has to take on Mewtwo with his, with his Pokemon and his friends and try and convince Mewtwo that not all humans are bad. Uh, Pokemon, he love humans are capable of loving Pokemon. We all need to get along, calm the hell down. Resulting in probably one of the most memorable scenes in Pokemon history where Mewtwo and Mew are literally fighting to the point of self-annihilation Ash throws himself in between to try and get them to stop fighting and dies or turns to stone It's not exactly clear, but he for all intents and purposes he dead and Pikachu cries He fucking cries and everyone who's watching cries. I don't care who you are You cannot watch that scene of Pikachu crying over his dead best friend and be like eh and then all the other Pokemon cry, and it's okay because Pokemon tears can bring people back to life, and then Mewtwo realizes he was being a dickhead and, and backs off. This movie is, without a doubt, 
one of the best things to ever come out of the Pokemon anime. It's almost perfect. Uh, Mewtwo is an incredibly complex, villainous character. He's not just, it's the legendary Pokemon here to save the day who can't speak. Or he can speak, he can talk, and he's the villain. He's the one who's out there ready to destroy people. There's a long been a consensus that there are no bad Pokemon, only bad people. And that's kind of the case for Mewtwo because he is where he is because of humans. But he's actively making the choice to try and kill everybody. Uh, it's the first time to really see Pokemon on the big screen for me as well. It was the first time seeing such large stakes for Pokemon. This was in the golden age of Pokemon as well. So again, the voice acting was top notch. The Pokemon involved were all of my favorite Pokemon, you know, Bulbasaur, Charizard, Squirtle, uh, uh, Togepi, Psyduck, all of them were there. Uh, Team Rocket were, were there with the usual hijinks. Uh, the soundtrack for this movie, the English soundtrack, I should say, is truly top notch. Um, it's com it's so rewatchable. I can rewatch Mewtwo Strikes Back probably twice in one day. It's a real powerful, intense movie that really knew how big Pokemon Hysteria was at the time it came out and knew how to run with it. It's really solid stuff. I love it, and I think everybody does too. No one listening to this is going to be like, I didn't really care for Mewtwo Strikes Back. Wrong. Everybody loves it. Everybody gets absolutely wrecked when they see Pikachu cry. Everybody gets frustrated when Charizard finally starts listening to Ash only to get completely annihilated by the clone Charizard. Uh, and Mewtwo's voiced by Yu-Gi-Oh! So that's good too. It's really, really good and it's my number two, but it doesn't quite make number one. Uh, before we get into number one, I do have the obligatory honorary mentions. Now, technically these are honorary mentions because any one of them could have been my number 10. As I said, the number 10 spot was hotly contested because I wasn't really that invested in my list by the time I got to number 10. Celebi, Voice of the Forest, the first Pokemon movie to not get a theatrical release here in the Australia or America or whatever, uh, and was sort of forgettable. Uh, felt more just like a longer episode of a TV show than an actual movie. Destiny Deoxys, the only good thing about it really for me is that it's an interesting concept of a technological city, but otherwise couldn't tell you what happens in it. Rise of Darkrai, that's quite good. I like the idea of a uh, excommunicated Pokemon. Darkrai just has this uh, rep for being bad, even though he's never done anything to warrant it. And I like the, the concept of the Diamond and Pearl movies where Dialga and Palkia are warring with each other and you go up the ladder of all these legendary Pokemon eventually building to an all-powerful Pokemon is pretty interesting which obviously continues on with Giratina and the Sky Warrior involving m multiple dimensions that's quite crazy which of course built to Arceus and the Jewel of Life Arceus is the god of all Pokemon I was so excited to watch this movie uh, I'd heard so much about Arceus but the movie itself is just sort of uh, forgettable I don't really remember what happened in it and Arceus, apart from like, people tell you it's the god of all Pokemon, but I don't feel like it's done anything to prove it. It could be Blasphemous, whatever. Zoroark, Master of Illusion. I like this one because it's not, Zoroark isn't really a legendary Pokemon. Uh, it's kind of like a, a crazier version of Ditto, so it can transform. So it's more a case of, it's a frame job sort of thing, where Zoroark's being framed for bad things, or, or... Uh, Terrible lies are being told to a town by a corrupt guy because he wants something out of it. It's pretty okay. Diancie and the Cocoon of Life. Really boring until the part where Xerneas shows up and literally starts turning everybody to stone. That's crazy. Hooper and the Clash of Ages. A great concept of having so many legendary Pokemon in the movie. Terrible in that Hooper is the most annoying thing I have ever seen. Volcanian and the Mechanical Marvel. I like the idea of a grumpy volcano being tied to Ash and then them having to work together to save another legendary. Uh, the Power of Us, the continuation of the I Choose You alternate timeline. Uh, I, it's probably better than I give it credit for, I just didn't really connect with it. And Mewtwo Strikes Back Evolution. Look, to be fair, it is just Mewtwo Strikes Back again. And a lot of people have problems with it because it's like, why would I watch that when I could just watch Mewtwo Strikes Back? And I get it. Uh, the problem is the movie does know that. It is just a retelling, uh, which can both help or hinder it. So I don't think people should condemn it so much as they do, but it's also not really a movie that's worth going. It, it's, it's good because it is just another movie again, but with dinner animation. If I have problems with Pokemon Black and White, then I have problems with Mewtwo Strikes Back and Mewtwo Strikes Back Evolution. 
But the number one Pokemon movie of all time for me is Pokemon the Movie 2000, The Power of One. I love this movie. Of the three big ones, this is my favorite. This is the one I rewatched the most. This is the one that sticks with me the most. This is the one that I enjoy. I can quote. Um, is it a better movie than Mewtwo Strikes Back? Probably not. But there's one thing about it that I think edges it out. Uh, basically, in the power of one, it's set in the Orange Islands era of Pokemon. Ash is traveling around the Orange Islands with Misty and Tracy. There's this super shady collector, which I guess is like a, a nasty version of a Pokemon trainer. But he wants to capture Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, the legendary birds, for his collection. But apparently he shouldn't do that. Because if he does, he'll upset the balance of the Earth itself and unleash apocalypse, unleash the end of days. Waters will rise up and, and flood the world. Uh, and like the protector Lugia will come and try and save the day. But according to a prophecy, Lugia apparently won't be able to do shit unless the world can turn and the world will turn to ash, which is very literal. The world will not turn to ash, the substance. It's ash the character. Ash, meanwhile, is, is is participating in this island ceremony where he has to go around to fire, lightning, and ice island and retrieve these relics. What starts off as just a fun game turns out, no, no, he has to actually do it. And he has to unite the three and play Lugia's song uh, to quell the beasts. Because eventually, Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres will break out of the Collector and start fighting, which will just make everything worse. But if they calm down, everything will be fine. Uh, Ash, of course, steps up to the challenge. Uh, things get really desperate. Lugia dies like four times. Uh, Ash has to rely on Pikachu and Bulbasaur and Charizard and Squirt on all his friends to help save the day. Misty almost says she loves Ash. She doesn't quite say it, but we know what she means. Um, and then at the end, there's some the, Lugia's theme. The theme for the Power of the One is my favorite piece of Pokemon music, and it's fantastic in this. The thing that makes it better for me than Mewtwo Strikes Back, the one thing that pushes it ahead, it's its usage of Team Rocket, Jesse, James, and Meowth. Now, I haven't talked about Team Rocket much for the last nine entries on here, aside from talking about Team Rocket adjacent villains, but not those, the trio. Because I think the reason this movie works for me better than the others is because it utilizes them. It makes a point of them being an important part of the movie. Jesse, James, and Meowth are an iconic part of Pokemon. They're always going to be there. From the moment Ash started out on his journey to the moment he's going to end it, they've always been there following along, trying to catch Pikachu. Sometimes the episodes would be about them actually trying to steal Pokemon. Sometimes they would be caught in the same issues that Ash is and they'd have to work together. Sometimes when Ash is competing in tournaments, they'd just be operating as hot dog vendors because you just got to be in there. But they are a mainstay. And it's the same for the movies. They will always be in the movies, regardless of whether they have anything important to do with the plot. Team Rocket are there. And sometimes it's frustrating because they'll show up for an obligatory scene and then move on. Sometimes they are a part of the plot, but not really. They're there, but they're not there. Mewtwo strikes back. They follow Ash all the way to Mewtwo's island. Meowth's there to comment on what's going on. They do interact with Ash when he's in the cloning chambers. But for the most part, they are just there watching the whole time. With the power of one, Team Rocket get involved. They realize that if the world is destroyed, there'll be no Pokemon left to steal. They don't want to. They don't. They, they don't want to lose their livelihood. So they get involved. They start helping Ash. And in the final act of the movie, they're the ones who show up with the the special life raft that can take Ash to the final relic and stop Lugia. Uh, they get caught up in the fighting with the birds. Uh, Lugia is being weighed down because he's carrying Ash and Team Rocket and Team Rocket make the decision to sacrifice themselves. They willingly let go of Lugia and prepare themselves to plummet to their deaths to let Ash save the world. That's incredible character development that shows how far they've come as characters, uh, their importance to each other, their relationship with Ash and with the world as a whole, and how regardless of what nefarious scheme they're up to on the show they are good people they know right from wrong they will always do the right thing uh in the end whatever and i like that i like that that's my favorite part of the movie is when jesse james and Meowth are part of everything and they're teaming up with ash to stop everything that's going on they are utilized and that's what i think makes the movie perfect for me it's not that everything else is so good as well but they take the one thing that pokemon movies struggle with and that's trying to 
do something with Team Rocket and they make them essential to the story. And that's the one thing that pushes this movie ahead of Mewtwo Strikes Back for me and why if I'm watching a Pokemon movie and Team Rocket are there until they become a part of the main story, the movie loses points for me because it's just like, it's frustration. It's come on, get them involved. Otherwise just don't have them in the movie, it's fine. But Team Rocket are great. Lugie is great, the music's great, Ash is great, the Orange Islands stories and all of that are great, and this movie, for me, is the number one Pokemon movie. Well, okay, I talked for 50 minutes, so that's probably longer than most of my rankings. Um, I don't know if I said anything worth listening to, but if you're still listening to me, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you're not too mad at my rankings. I hope you're pleasantly surprised. As I said, if you're mad, don't be because life's too short to worry about that sort of shit. Just go and make your own list. Think about your favorite Pokemon movies, and if you want to tell me, I'll gladly listen. Uh, Otherwise, I'll be back next week. Um, My episode will be later in the week, because I'll be waiting for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania to come out, and then I will review it for you, and I'm very excited for it. And I hope it's good. Please let it be good. It would be very upsetting if it's not. But until then, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this ride on Pokemon movies with me. I hope you're enjoying Ash's victory lap, his farewell tour on the anime. Um, Will you still be watching when Ash is gone? I won't be, because Pikachu. If there's no Pikachu, why bother, baby? That's it. Uh, Until next week, I love and appreciate you as always. You've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.